Here are my favorite opening traps in the most aggressive chess opening for white, the king's gambit, where you undermine your opponent's center and self-confidence right on the second move. In this position, your opponent will usually either, either take your gambit pawn or defend his own pawn on e5. We'll have a look at these both options. So let's start by black defending this pawn. Then you attack it once again with your knight from f3 and black continues with pawn to d6. This is a really juicy position with a lot of interesting tactical motifs. Here you play bishop c4. That's the common square for your bishop in the king's gambit where you target this weakest square f7 and it's gonna support your future attack. Black will often go bishop to g4 because they love this pin overall, plus they also might feel unpleasant that otherwise without this bishop on g4 you might actually jump forward with knight to g5 aiming for something similar to the fried liver attack. So they do play bishop g4 quite a a lot, quite a lot. Then you castle king side, and here there's a really tempting opportunity for black to go knight d4, trying to capitalize on this pin. And they attack this knight on f3, and they start feeling like they're putting pressure. But the truth is exactly the opposite. In this case, you ruin your opponent's position by playing bishop takes f7 tactics. Although it comes as a ball from the blue, in this position it's actually quite a common sacrifice in the king's gambit, because you've got this open f-file for your rook, and therefore it makes sense for you to wish to open the f-file. So after bishop takes, black recaptures, and then you play knight g5 check. Here's the point, you want to regain the bishop on the next move with interest, because along the way you just exposed your opponent's king, won a pawn and ruined his position overall. There is also one funny variation which could happen here, and it did happen to me a few times in Blitz, where your opponent thinks here for some time, and then he actually finds the way to get out of this trap as they think. So they capture on g5 and their calculation goes like this. You know what, I'm gonna get rid of this check and on the next move I'm regaining my queen with material advantage. So they think that they outsmarted you and they happily play this move queen takes g5. Then you recapture and at this point you, you can see that there are some seconds that are going by while your opponent probably is trying desperately to capture your queen but is getting that annoying beep sound of an illegal move. And after some time your opponent realizes that hey, Actually, that's a discover check to his king after pawn takes g5. And therefore, he has no time to capture the queen. He's got to move the king. And after that happens, actually, you're going to grab the bishop with a completely winning position. Most of your opponents, however, will simply drop back with their king. And after that, you get back your bishop on g4. Still, your opponent has a glimpse of hope because they realize that, hey, they can grab this pawn on c2 and on the next move, they're going to grab your rook. But then you play pawn takes e5 and on the next move, basically regardless of what your opponent does, in most cases they are, are gonna recapture, they think that if you check them, they're gonna cover and life's good. But instead of checking, you shock them once again with this nasty sacrifice rook takes a fate. The forces king to take and after that you follow up with this royal fork to the king and the queen. Actually this pawn on g7 is also under the attack and that's how you win material, you continue attacking the king and you've got a completely won game. All right, here's the second trap, which arises from black accepting the gambit, and the, then you play knight to f3, which is a development move, but also you take control of this square h4 so that they can't jump out and deliver a check to your king. Now, in this position, one of the main ways for black to play is actually to play g5, because if not, you're gonna go, let's say I'll play some random move for black just to illustrate the point. White is gonna play pawn d4, regain the pawn with a great position. They occupy the center, they've got better development, etc. Therefore, it makes sense for black to actually play g5, which first of all overprotects this pawn on f4 so that it's never easy for white to get it back, and secondly black might even wish to push the pawn forward, drive away this knight and then still come up with that nasty check queen h4. So that is the idea behind this move g5. But here I've realized that when you play pawn h4, like quite often it actually confuses your opponents if they don't know much theory about it because the king's gambit is not like the mainstream opening. And here they realize that there's a problem. If they take on h4, then all of these pawns are extremely weak and you're gonna pick them up gradually one by one, you know, by the rook, by the bishop, so that's pretty bad for black. Normally black would wish to play pawn h6 to maintain their beautiful pawn chain, but in this position it fails, because then you take on g5 and it turns out that black can't recapture because the pawn is pinned, in this case they'd lose their rook on, on the h8, so that's not an option. 
Of course, they could try to push the pawn forward, but in this case, as you jump forward, you start attacking here, the knight is active, you can play bishop c4 and attack this pawn as well. So, although it is a normal way for black to play it, and in fact the correct way to play it, but black needs to know some theory here. So, going back, those who are more on a beginner level and who just wish to maintain this pawn chain may be tempted to play pawn to f6, thinking, okay, if you recapture that I take by my pawn from f6 and my position is great, which is quite okay for black indeed, but instead of capturing with a pawn, all of a sudden you just sack your knight on g5, which comes as a complete surprise, black recaptures, but here comes queen to h5 check. And that is basically the end of story. So here you've got the crushing attack against your opponent's king, especially given the fact that the rest of his army is completely undeveloped. Now you follow up with queen takes g5, another check to the king, you also x-ray the queen on d8, by the way, they can't easily cover because then you play e5, and because the knight is pinned, that's going to be devastating for black. So let's take it back. In most cases, they just bring the king back to e8, and here you actually need to know how to finalize this attack. It's still not easy. It's still e easy to spoil the position. But you do this by going queen h5, which once again forces your opponent's king into this unfavorable position on e7, where it blocks all the other pieces. Then you play queen e5. Now, black can't cover this king, they have no queen e7 move or anything. They have to play king to f7, but then you play bishop c4, and now this is the beginning of the end. If that goes king g6, you could grab this rook in some of these lines, but you don't even have to, because you can just go after this king and simply checkmate it. After king g7, queen f7 check, supported by the bishop, king goes, and actually leads to quite a funny checkmate in this line. After queen f7 and king to h6, the final check, which is also a checkmate, is a modest move pawn to d3. And it may not be even obvious at first why is this move so strong, but the bishop from c1 or sniper is actually delivering the final blow. And I mean, black can sack the queen, but then it's going to be checkmate anyway. The next trap is a real killer. I used it even against title opponents. After your, your opponent accepts this gambit pawn, you play knight f3, g5, still were following the main line, but then you deviate by going knight to c3. And initially, this seems like just a wrong move, that you kind of messed it up and you didn't realize that g4 is coming and that it's a serious issue for you. So your opponent is happily playing pawn g4, you then play knight e5, and now they play queen h4. So they think that you actually missed their main attacking intent and now you're in trouble because you either have to move the king forward, which is ugly and the king will be exposed, or you have to play g3, but it seems to be pretty bad as well because black just cover takes the pawn on g3 and it looks like within a couple of moves, you know, you're gonna have serious troubles here. However, it is not the case and we've got something prepared. In this position you play queen takes g4, which actually hits this queen on h4. And although black could trade queens and go into this about equal endgame, it still remains to be tricky and you have some lead in development, you can go knight d5 aiming for this knight takes c7 fork, so it is still tricky, you still have some initiative here. But in most cases your pawn will realize that, hey, I was going here queen h4 not just to trade queens and try to equalize in an endgame. They play pawn g2 because that is a standard tactics here. This is a check to the king and after you seemingly win the queen, they regain their queen but also grab your rook in the corner. And they think that they outsmarted you, that they just now currently up a rook, your king is exposed and they're gonna win. But this is not the case. The issue for black here is that they're underdeveloped plus their queen got stuck on h1. If you look at the queen, it actually has n almost no squares where to go because all these squares are actually controlled by white. And so they're kind of, you know, really behind in development. So in this position, queen h5 is really strong, hitting this pawn f7, aiming to something similar to scholar's checkmate. But in this game, white played another move, which is also interesting. They played knight to d5, having these two beautiful knights in the middle of the board. And that actually threatens knight takes c7, which in this case is not only a fork, but that would be just checkmate, given the fact that your queen controls this diagonal. Now, after knight d5, black played knight a6, and white just played d4. White simply wants to capitalize on his development and to launch his attack. Black decided to play bishop e7, attacking the queen and developing a bishop, but white finished the game in style with queen takes e7. Really an expected move, and I wonder how black felt at this point, because why we kind of came up with different surprises basically at every turn. And queen e7 is actually going to be a checkmate on the next move. Knight f6 is check, and now we have two twin lines. If king goes here, then it's checkmate by, by the bishop and a knight. And if instead black goes to d8, then it's checkmate by two knights, and that is what we call legitimately a nightmare.
The next trap is really powerful because it works against most common moves of your opponent. In this position you bait your opponent to play queen h4 by not playing knight f3, the main line, but instead playing bishop c4. We know that it is a standard move in the king's gambit, just taking aim at this weakness, however in this case black is really tempted to play queen h4 check to your king. But another advantage of having the bishop developed is that you've got this f1 square where your king is really well defended and there is no danger. Now, queen h4 in itself is not a such a bad idea, but black needs to know how to follow up, which they don't. And they follow up in the most straightforward way possible. They play bishop c5 hoping that you're gonna blunder this queen to f2 scholar's checkmate. But you won't. You'll play pawn d4, gaining one tempo for your development and showing to your opponent that bishop c5 was wrong. Now black has to waste time and move this bishop back. Then you gain one more tempo by developing your knight and hitting the queen. And here black realizes that first of all they're running around with their pieces, wasting time and making no progress while you just keep developing. Plus, if the queen drops back, you can just get back this pawn on f4, and usually in the king's gambit, if you can get back this gambited pawn on f4, you know, comfortably, then you just have a much superior position, thanks to your better development, to bishops, strong center, etc. So black may at least wish to hold on to this extra pawn by going queen to g4. But then, here comes our usual surprise. In the king's gambit, bishop takes f7. The standard sacrifice, but the idea behind it is a bit unusual. Here black can't take it because after that knight takes to e5 will be this royal fork and you're gonna win the queen on the next move. Now they usually see this and so they don't accept the bishop sacrifice, they play king to f8. But there is something interesting here, the queen is going to be trapped anyway. You play pawn h3 and just look at this, it's a really unusual situation where all these squares where your opponent's queen could possibly go to are actually controlled by you. And the only remaining square is this g3 square. But then you continue with knight c3, you still ignore the fact that your bishop is hanging, and you want to play knight e2 and capture this queen on g3. And black is actually defenseless, because you are going to play knight e2 regardless of what your opponent's going to do. And if they capture this bishop on f7, you still play knight e2, attacking the queen. The only square for the queen to go to, especially given the fact that we control these two squares, is queen to g6. But that goes right into our knight to e5 fork, where you grab the queen on the next move, then you get back your opponent of four, and you have a winning position. I've just opened an online database of Blitz games so that we can see how effective the next trap is. We're playing at f3 here going into the main line. Now you can see that the two most common moves for black are either g5, which we have talked about already, or knight to c6, which also seems like a normal developing move. So let's say they go knight to c6. Now you play pawn d4. And that kind of threatens pawn d5, pushing this knight away. They feel uncomfortable and they want to stop that by going pawn d5. That's what they do. Now you trade on d5, they recapture and you follow up with knight to c3 hitting the queen. As you can see, the top choice of black here is playing queen e6 check, which is wrong and which puts black in a really dangerous position. By the way, your position is great in any case, so you have no risk here, you have a slightly better game. But queen e6 is just wrong, which already gives black like a severe disadvantage. So first off, that kind of blocks development, they can't bring their bishop out. Also, the king and queen are standing dangerously here on the e-file, which we can exploit in the future. But besides those generalities, there is a very straightforward problem as well. You're threatening d5 fork to the queen and knight. And, like, funnily enough, black overlooks this all the time. If you can see, all the top choices of black are developing their bishop or their knight or the bishop to d6. They all have nothing to do with you playing pawn d5 and winning the piece on c6. Moreover, after that there is like an additional bonus trap, so to say. After black plays something and you now win this knight on c6, they take on c3, check your king, you cover, they play queen takes c6. Now you have a completely winning position, you're up a piece plus you are having much superior uh, development, therefore you have great chances for a quick attack, but also you can play rook b1, which looks like you just put the rook to the semi-open file, and your opponents usually simply develop one way or the other, but then you follow up with bishop b5, which skews the queen and the king, and that also wins the queen. If you'd like to know how to find such beautiful attacking ideas on your own, in your own games, then check out this free masterclass where I break it down. Keep crushing it, and I'll talk to you soon.